Good morning, I'm Leonora Manai, Editor for Working at Duke and Duke Today and Executive Director of Communications and Communication Services. Today, I'm joined by Kyle Cavanaugh, Vice President for Administration and Emergency Coordinator. Also, I'm joined by Dr. Carol Epling, Director of Employee Occupational Health and Wellness. As has been announced, Duke will phase in a return of faculty and staff over time in a coordinated process to ensure appropriate social distancing available of PPE and COVID testing capabilities. Today, we're gonna to talk with Kyle and Dr. Epling about what a Duke reopening will look like. Um, hi, Kyle. Since mid-March, Duke has limited campus activity to only supporting critical on-site operations. We talked with you for a recent story, Inside the Planning for a Pandemic, a Timeline of Duke's Response. I encourage everyone watching to read that story on Working at Duke to get more information about Duke's coordinated early response. To help bring our viewers up to date with the most recent campus preparations, can you please provide a sense for Duke's response and planning for a phased and controlled return in the past week? Well, good morning, Leonora. Uh, first, I hope uh, you and your family are uh, safe and well and uh, doing great, and also to the rest of my colleagues uh, across uh, the Duke community, uh, I wish the same. Uh, there is enormous amount of activity going on. Um, it's probably best to describe what's happening day to day, and then also as we're looking uh, to the future. Uh, as you know, our colleagues in the health system uh, have continued to provide uh, phenomenal care uh, to the region. Uh, we are so fortunate to have the collaboration uh, with our health system partners. Uh, we still have, which is a surprise to some people, uh, six to 700 uh, employees coming to work every day. So we have a number of our critical labs that have continued uh, to operate like the Vaccine Institute, we still have about 300 or so uh, undergraduate students on campus, so supporting them are phenomenal uh, colleagues in police and security, and so those people are still coming to work now every day. Uh, we have uh, put in place, uh, thanks to uh, the great work of Dr. Epling and uh, Dr. Vaughn and Dr. Wolf, uh, who have been guiding us uh, throughout this process, with a lot of preventive strategies. Uh, so those individuals coming in are wearing masks every day. Uh, those individuals are practicing uh, social distancing um, and we have those new behaviors uh, going on every day. We have a number of different groups that have been working constantly. So since the end of January, as your story that you referenced uh, speaks to, We've had a COVID-19 task force that has been meeting every day. Uh, that group continues to meet. Uh, it is dealing with the day-to-day -day issues, but now starting to lean towards uh, the future. Uh, as you're aware, uh, President Price has launched uh, two different uh, strategy groups, uh, one that is held, uh, headed up by Provost Kornbluth, uh, which is the 2030 planning group and one that is co-chaired by uh, Jennifer Francis, the executive vice provost, and myself. Uh, that group is uh, looking more towards the uh, fall and next spring. And under that group, it is a coordinating body that is uh, continuing to expand. We have a lot of work going on right now in preparing all of our facilities. And so as you might expect, uh, facilities are a key aspect of this, ensuring that we have uh, new cleaning regimes in place, that we have appropriate uh, hand sanitizers and dispensers uh, ready to go, and that work is uh, continuing as we go. We have also developed uh, a whole set of guidelines that we'll be releasing here shortly that will start to talk about how we go about phasing uh, this work in the future. The committee that I mentioned is coordinating, looking at a continuum of different options for the fall. Those options could range from where we are right now, which is essentially in a virtual environment, to as close to a new normal as possible, and a whole host of different variations in there. We are trying to be as inclusive in that communication as we can. Uh, we've had a lot of conversation with our faculty groups from APC and UPC. Um, and ECAC and others were uh, having constant updates with our dean and leadership, deans and leadership. So all of that work is going on. 
Probably the most immediate thing to talk about is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have 600 or so people coming into work. A uh, majority of those are working in some of our critical labs. We believe that the controls that we've established in those labs are actually wonderful teaching environments for us to think about a phased increase operation in our lab uh, work. So Colin Duckett in the School of Medicine, Larry Karen, uh, our Vice Provost of Research, have been hard at work uh, developing strategies of how we can safely start to think about opening up some additional uh, essential labs. And we plan on doing that over the next two weeks. Uh, let me stop there. Uh, hopefully that gives kind of a, a broad sense of a lot of the planning and work that's going on every day and getting us ready for the immediate future and then looking towards the fall. Thanks, Kyle. I may come back um, after we uh, touch base with Dr. Epling um, uh, with a couple of things you mentioned, if that's okay. Um, Dr. Epling, the top priority of employee occupational health and wellness is obviously the health and safety um, of the 40,000 people who make up the Duke workforce. Your department developed a comprehensive response system to, our, for our, to keep our healthcare workers safe on the front lines during this pandemic. Now, as we anticipate the return of more staff and faculty to campus, Dr. Epling, what precautions are being considered to ensure their health and safety? Thanks, Leonora. Um, I'll start really the same way Kyle did to set the stage a little bit. We've had about 16,000 Duke employees steadily working these past six weeks. Most are health system employees who are, who've been providing extraordinary patient care dur during this very challenging time of rapid change. In addition, we've had this small group, as Kyle mentioned, of university employees providing essential services, including lab animal care, transportation, security, facilities maintenance, and others. As the health system leadership is implementing a careful phased approach focused on continuing to safely care for patients with COVID-19, they are also needing to enhance access to Duke Health patients who may have delayed care and they are prioritizing providing care to the sickest first. As these changes in operations are implemented over the next several weeks, measures are being taken to ensure the safety of employees and patients. And these include continuing to use telehealth uh, to provide patient care as much as possible so we can completely avoid inpatient uh, care visits whenever possible. I see as I walked in today, much uh, activity going on to help with queuing and signage in our clinical environment so that we can practice social distancing each and every day. So with, as clinics reopen to patients, there'll be more time between patient visits, allowing us to observe the six feet of social distance that we need to maintain as much as possible. Visitors to our facilities will continue to be restricted We'll continue to screen for symptoms every day prior to entry into the facilities for our patients, our visitors, and our employees. And we'll continue the very important practice of mandatory masking for all, that is for employees, for patients, and for visitors. We'll also continue to emphasize one of the, mo the most important thing, hand washing, the basic hand washing need and there has been a great emphasis on supplying additional hand sanitizing stations throughout the facilities. Thanks Carol. Um, we may uh, come back to a couple of points that you made in that question but I want to get back to Kyle. Um, Kyle, would the City of Durham and Durham County's joint extension of the stay-at-home order um, ending May 15th what does that mean for Duke? Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what are some of the considerations for when and how Duke will have staff and faculty return to campus? 
Sure, Leonora. Uh, first and foremost, I would say that we're really fortunate again that we have a great collaboration going on with our uh, governmental affairs individuals who have had day-to-day -day contact with the governor's office in North Carolina and that same level of contact with the mayor and with the county commissioner. Uh, that has uh, been exceedingly strong partnership and we hope to continue that. Uh, to be clear, uh, it's, it's not evident as we sit here today on May 1, what will happen on May 15th. So first we have to see what exactly happens. But let's go down the assumption that the uh, stay at home order is rescinded. Uh, we would anticipate that still the majority of people would continue to uh, work from home. So uh, to build on what Carol Epling uh, had mentioned earlier, uh, the plan would be for a very controlled phase re-entry. And so this is not something where everybody would return to work immediately. As I referenced earlier, our immediate priority would be to continue to bring up our research enterprise. Uh, we have some initial labs identified where we'll be expanding to those in some of our wet labs. We'll then be looking at some of the dry labs to bring those up. So it'll be a very controlled phased approach. Additional information will be coming out to each of the unit lead heads over the next couple of weeks. And a lot is really going to depend on what actually happens in the environment. So in addition to taking a look at what governmental restrictions happen, we are going to look at what data is uh, available to us in terms of the prevalence of the disease in our community. So uh, in short, uh, when that happens, uh, everybody should not be prepared to rush back to work. Uh, that we will be doing this in a very phased, controlled manner. Thanks, Kyle. That's really helpful. It's going to be helpful for people to hear. Um, just a quick follow-up on that. If, if you can share anything around perhaps uh, what areas or activities um, do you, in this current environment now, do you see returning to operation more quickly and why? Yeah, I think uh, I, I would repeat what I said earlier. The, the highest priority that we have are two areas right now. Uh, Dr. Epling mentioned uh, about our ability to start uh, systematically opening up uh, critical care areas. And those uh, clinical areas are the highest priority we probably have as an enterprise. Uh, and we want to do this, if you think about this as somewhat opening up the faucet, we want to open that faucet in a very thoughtful, controlled way. I think it's very important for us to understand uh, this virus is still uh, alive and active in our geographical area. And so as we start to enter more people back into our environment, be that in the health system or on the campus side, we wanna do it again in a very controlled, measured way. So uh, clinical care being the highest priority. Second uh, priority would be our research enterprise and to start slowly bringing that uh, online. That would be our, again, our wet labs, our dry labs, but then there's also research that happens in our libraries and to start thinking about how we can systematically do that. That will be the highest priority. As we go through that, we are also going to be observing, measuring, learning. Uh, are the preventive things that we've put in place working? Are people complying with the things that we want them to comply with? Are people uh, masking appropriately? Are they adhering to the social distancing requirements that will be in there? Those will be all learning opportunities for us over the next couple of weeks to see can we move to next phases of continuing to expand the number of people that we would bring back. Thanks Kyle, that's super helpful. Uh, Dr. Epling, um, as some of these things that Kyle mentioned and as operations expand on campus, what safety precautions do you really want to see faculty and staff on campus taking? And why are these important? We've heard, heard about cloth masks and things like that. Tell us all about that. Well, faculty and staff returning to campus will need to continue to observe the public health measures that we know limit exposure and potential spread of this virus. We must practice social distancing, wash our hands frequently, and wear a face covering to protect other people. Social distancing calls for us all to be very thoughtful in the ways we move about throughout our workday, beginning with thinking about how we arrive to work 
and thinking about are there ways that we can stagger our arrival so that we can respect the distance between one another and try to maintain that six feet distance. We should consider modifying work schedules to reduce the number of people sharing a common space as we will need to increase the distance between employees in open work areas and in meeting rooms. Frequent careful hand washing is critical using soap and water for 20 seconds or using hand sanitizer that's going to be present much more uh, around every corner and it will be containing the 60% alcohol that we know works on the hands. And then wearing a face covering, either a disposable mask or a homemade face covering that can be reworn after laundering each night will protect those near the wearer. I would suggest that for anyone who wishes to wear a homemade face covering, that they consider getting a supply of perhaps seven different face coverings and setting them out so that they can have their Monday face covering, their Tuesday, their Wednesday, and then they can batch them in order to launder them properly. We will need to wear the face masks throughout our entire workday to protect each other. The face covering should only be removed when we're eating or when we're working alone in a private office. We really shouldn't remove them when we're working alone in a shared work area or when we're working on shared equipment. And we need to take good care when we're eating a meal. Break rooms will not be the same as they were for us back in February. We need to consider how many employees can safely be in the break room while practicing social distancing in a setting where if anyone's going to eat, they're gonna take down their face mask. We should never eat facing one another to avoid that potential spread of, um, of secretions as we talk, laugh, or sneeze. And when we're done in a common area with our activities, we really need to take good care wiping down surfaces with sanitizer for the next person. We need to take care of each other every day. And probably my most important point here, and I've said it many times, don't come to work when sick. This has been a long-standing message and it's never been more important. And we have resources to assist if a faculty or staff member develops symptoms that may be consistent with COVID. Every person needs to monitor their own symptoms every day before coming into work. They need to take note, do I feel like I'm having a fever? Do I have a cough, a new cough, a shortness of breath, sore throat, runny nose, chills, muscle pain, new GI symptoms or new loss of smell or taste? And if so, the employee needs to isolate. They need to call the COVID hotline in order to access employee health and arrange for prompt testing that very day. We will help them with that. And then employee health will help support them through the next steps, will provide them with their results and will help manage their safe return to work. So I'm so happy to say that we have those resources here in place We've been very um, blessed to have these resources and to have them every day available to us for this past six weeks. Thanks, Dr. Epling. Um, we've, we've touched on the physical aspect and physical health, and obviously this has been a very trying time mentally, um, the challenges that people are dealing with just to be in this situation. And one of the components, if people aren't aware out there, is that employee health um, also provides, under, under Dr. Epling's department, um, mental health counseling through in-house personal assistance service. Um, so during these trying times, Dr. Epling, um, can you talk a bit more about how that service can help our 
workforce, our staff and faculty. Sure, thank you, Leonore. Many people who have never needed support are now finding themselves unsure of how to deal with this increased anxiety, uncertainty, and isolation that this pandemic has brought. It is valid to want to talk to someone about these things. And few of us want to process this alone. PAS can help people maintain perspective. One does not need to have a mental health problem to use PAS. Being confined to home is very difficult. Dealing with the daily change and uncertainty, and even now as we think about the next phases in, of potentially reopening carefully and slowly, there's still so much uncertainty that it can be very stressful. Facing demands of homeschooling and caring for sick parents or other family members are stressing many of our Duke faculty and staff. So they can use the short-term services of PAS as a check-in with a trained listener who can help provide them with an ear to be able to feel reconnected and understand the normal and natural reactions that they're having. For those who are experiencing strong reactions or who already have symptoms of depression or anxiety, PAS counselors can provide methods for coping and referrals when needed to longer term counselors or psychiatrists who are covered by our health insurance so that the faculty and staff member can obtain longer term counseling. Thanks, Dr. Epling. And real quick on that, I just want to make sure that folks are aware. Are there are there a certain? It's a no charge for the initial short term counseling, or a no no charge for staff and faculty. Is that is that accurate? Or absolutely, the PAS is a benefit to us uh, as faculty and staff, and to our adult dependents as well. Okay, thanks, Dr. Epling. I think that's going to be very helpful for people to hear. Um, turning to you, Kyle, uh, looking ahead and with experts predicting a possible second wave of the virus in the fall, um, how will Duke continue to monitor and respond to outbreaks? If you can sort of look at your crystal ball and, and tell us a bit about that. Yeah, the crystal ball planning has been uh, difficult uh, at best. I, I probably would do a better job of predicting who's winning the Super Bowl for years from now than telling you exactly what is going to happen in the fall. So we are planning uh, with a lot of ambiguity uh, around this. I should have mentioned this uh, earlier. Uh, we are talking to peer institutions and to other employers and to government officials every single day. Uh, I think we have the best information and certainly uh, the best colleagues that one could want in an organization to try to navigate this. So as we look at the fall, uh, there are at least two different issues that come. There's the planning for how many people we can safely support while here. There is the projection that we could see a what's referred to a second wave or what is uh, euphemistically being called avoid the W, where you can kind of swing back. It's also imperative to understand that this is also going to be happening during our, quote, normal flu season. And so one of the very first things that we're going to be doing is aggressively pushing for people to get their flu shot. Uh, so that is going to be one of the key kind of uh, preventive measures that we have. We have uh, plans in place that if we were to see a uh, second outbreak, uh, all of the things we've learned over the last couple of months of how do we very quickly uh, identify people, have them uh, monitoring symptoms, get them appropriately aligned with our health professionals, if needed, quickly getting them tested, doing what has been referred to as uh, case tracking or contact tracking uh, in a very quick, efficient manner, and then if needed, that individual uh, being isolated. This is no longer theoretical work. Uh, Dr. Epling and her team have now actually had uh, thousands of opportunities uh, to practice this. 
Uh, John Vaughn in student health has had hundreds of opportunities now to practice this. So we have had positive cases within our own community. Those have been incredibly effectively managed. So we're feeling cautiously optimistic uh, in our preparation and thinking about the fall, but also if we were to see that, how best to manage that. Thanks, Kyle. Um, in wrapping up, I uh, just want to throw a question at each of you. Um, obviously, this has been a difficult and trying time for many, including both of you, with all that you have on your plates. Um, what have you been doing, keeping Healthy Duke in mind, uh, to help manage um, these stressful times? What are you looking forward to when, and hopefully soon, once some form of normalcy returns. If we can start with you, Dr. Epling, and then um, to you, Kyle. As much as possible, I try to focus my thoughts on the positive things that are happening. I try to practice the mindfulness of noting the good things that have occurred every, each and every day. And I have had the great fortune to work with an extremely wonderful team at Employee Health uh, and have had an, a terrific group of redeployed staff who've come to us from multiple uh, groups and have come together supporting Duke employees in, in a truly amazing way. Um, I'll try to recharge through exercise and reading and I have relied very heavily on the strength of connections to family and friends. And what I'm looking forward to uh, are some simple things, uh, including having my house more full again with friends of my children, draining my refrigerator every day. Um, and I have my mother is in a long-term care facility for memory loss. And so like many, that facility has been closed to visitors for a month and a half. So I'm really looking forward to when that will reopen and I'll be able to spend time with her. Thanks, Carol. I hope your mom stays well. Um, how about you, Kyle? Tell us all about your plans. Well, uh, first, I, I think uh, somewhat similar to Dr. Epling, um, my energy uh, has really been drawn from uh, the engagement, the commitment, the spirit of the Duke community, uh, from our trustees to our leadership, to every employee that we've had the opportunity to interface with. We talk a lot about the institutional values of Duke. Uh, they have never been more on display than over the last three or four months. And for me personally, that has been uh, incredibly energizing. So that, that's probably the first thing. I think looking forward to, uh, there are probably two things. Uh, first, uh, I really need a hug from both of my daughters. Uh, so one is in Austin, Texas, and one is here. Uh, we've been able to, on occasion, uh, see each other. We've been able to uh, do Zooms, uh, but I have not physically been in their presence for quite some time. And so that's, that's probably number one. And, and number two, as uh, Mr. Grantham would know, I am really yearning to get back out and do some fly fishing. And so that's probably the, the two things I'm looking most uh, forward to. Thanks, Kyle. So I wanna thank you both very much for taking time out of your day today to, to talk with us and to talk with the Duke community. And I just personally wanna thank you um, for everything that you both are doing and all the healthcare workers on the front lines. Um, I'm proud to work at Duke and personally feel safe in your hands. So thank you. Um, and to our listeners out there, uh, please tune in to Working at Duke on Duke Today, working.duke.edu and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, for today, that's it, I'm signing off. Thank you for listening and watching. And once again, thank you Kyle Cavanaugh and Dr. Carol Epling for being with us. Produced by the Office of Communication Services, online at today.duke.edu slash working.